So in this little clip, I will just review some aspects of auxiliary regressions. Um, the uh, I might just sorry regressions. So I introduce them to do something which we already know to do to test a multiple restriction. And here the auxiliary regression is an alternative to the F test. Okay. But without really any advantages. I'll just introduce it here so that you know that you already understand the problem we are testing and it's just a different methodology. Whenever you want to test multiple restrictions like this you can also use uh, an F-test. So here is the problem. Um, let me use some different variables. So let's say our dependent variable is called M. I and I have coefficients gamma naught plus gamma one equals, and now we have a number of auxiliary regression uh, or um, explanatory variables. Set I going to x i plus gamma three p i plus an error term v i. So. Let's say we want to test the following null hypothesis. Gamma 2 and gamma 3 are equal to 0. And the alternative that either of these two is unequal to 0. All right. So I assume you know how to do that with F-test, not a problem. Here we'll use the auxiliary regression. And it all starts in step one with estimating the restricted model. Okay, you'll also have to do that in an F-test, right? so you have to do that here. So the restricted model is MI equals gamma naught plus gamma one set I plus an error term, use a new error term because it now contains all the other stuff. So we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true Therefore, I can use the same coefficient values. If I was to assume uh, it wasn't true, we'd, uh, I'd have to use different coefficient values because then these guys would be biased. So, from estimating this, we obtain a common not hat. Uh, actually, yeah. So actually, instead of calling these, if I was to call them gamma not hat, well, usually when we estimate this model here, the unrestricted model, and we estimate that by OLS, we would call our estimated coefficients gamma not hat, gamma one hat, and so forth. Now, the coefficient from here is not going to be exactly the same as this guy. Okay, so this one is not going to be the same. Therefore, I don't want to call this gamma hat, but I'm going to call it gamma tilde. And the tilde here is also an indicator of an estimator, um, but it's not the same as if I had estimated it from the unrestricted model. And I'll get gamma 1 tilde and yeah, so these guys are the OLS estimates.
from estimating this restricted model by OLS and once I have these two guys I can also estimate all the UI and again I call them tilders so you have full series for all the UIs if you have a full series we often put these curly brackets around all right so this is the first step now the question arises how do I test my hypothesis because remember this is still what we are after this is what we want to test so the key point here is now that we're gonna derive a test statistic which will take a value of zero or very close to zero if the null hypothesis the null hypothesis is true but if the null hypothesis is not true we will obtain a value that is significantly larger than zero and we will um, and as you already know because you've saw the lecture notes the test statistic is going to be based on an r squared of an auxiliary regression and in particular it is going to be calculated by n times r squared where this is the r squared from an auxiliary regression so now we haven't said yet what the auxiliary regression is so we'll write this down here but we want that if h naught is true then we want r squared to be approximately zero and therefore the test statistic n times r squared to be approximately zero. If however the alternative hypothesis or if h naught is not true then we want r squared to be larger than zero and therefore the test statistic n times r squared to be larger than zero. So also you already know from the lecture notes that the auxiliary regression will, will have as a dependent variable these estimated residuals, the estimated residuals from the restricted model. So, and now comes the key step. Let's think about what type of explanatory variables would we have to put onto the right hand side of this auxiliary regression. Which type of variables would we have to use as explanatory variables in this auxiliary regression to achieve exactly what we argued here. So if the null hypothesis was true then let us just go up to the full model then xi and pi should be irrelevant because these guys here these coefficients are equal to zero. In that, in that case will there be any effect of these variables ending up in the estimated error term of this restricted model? The answer is no, because we know these guys will go into the error term, but if the coefficient is zero, they will essentially not go into the error term because of that zero coefficient. So if the null hypothesis was true, then we could put these variables xi and pi, we could put them as explanatory variables onto the right hand side of this regression. I'll leave the coefficient open for the time being. Okay. So our first condition here seems to be met by this xi and pi. What however if the null hypothesis is not true? So if the null hypothesis is not true, then these coefficients, gamma 2 and gamma 3, will be unequal to zero. 
In that case, indeed, if we estimate the restricted model, these residuals here, so if we have this case, then these residuals will basically capture all of this stuff. Okay, so that will go in here. That means in the estimated UI there will be some effect coming in from the PI and the XI. Now if there is some effect of the PI and the XI, if we then if we were to then regress UI tilde on XI and PI, well then that regression will recognize I oh, there is some correlation between what happens in the XI here and what happens in the UI tilde here, because that UI tilde in the green case under the alternative hypothesis, that would be some sort of function of XI and PI. Okay, so if that is the case, then we will find some relationship here, and that means that in that case, indeed, our R squared of this auxiliary regression will be larger than zero. So these two explanatory variables here do exactly the job to achieve what we want to achieve here. So now we need to complete that. We need some uh, coefficient values. We'll, um, let's use a, um, a delta, delta naught, a, I'll say, plus delta 1 x i plus delta 2 p i now and a, um, a new arrow term let's call that w i now it turns out that when you re have an auxiliary regression that uses estimated residuals from a regression here from the restricted regression you have to use all explanatory variables you used in that restricted regression also in here, in that auxiliary regression. So we'll also have to include delta 3 times zi. But we do know from the properties of an OLS, of OLS residuals, as these guys are, these are OLS residuals, these guys these guys will be uncorrelated to that set i. That means this set i will not contribute to explaining variation in ui tilde. Therefore it will not contribute to this argument. But for some technical reason which I don't want to, uh, to discuss, it has to be included. So this is our auxiliary regression. An important thing, important aspect here are these two explanatory variables because they will differentiate between these two cases. So your second step you estimate this model by OLS estimate by OLS and obtain the R squared and then the third step is indeed just calculate the test stat so, so I calculate n times r squared, where the n is just the number of observations used here, which is the same number of observations as in your original regression. Now, we know that the r squared is going to be positive, so n times r squared is going to live on the positive scale. Okay. So in how is that distribution going to look like? Well, I told you that this guy under the null hypothesis is chi-square distributed with k degrees of freedom where k is the number of restrictions. Here we have k equal to 2. Why k equal to 2? Because we are testing 1, 2 restrictions. And they indeed they also translate to basically two restrictions here. These two variables are the important one. Now a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom will possibly look something like this. 
And what we need is a critical value. And we want the critical value that cuts off alpha percent of the distribution over here. And that you can get from tables for the, uh, for the chi-square distribution. And then once we calculated our test statistic, if the test statistic is to the right of that critical value, we shall reject H0 because that means our R squared is sufficiently large such that we are in this case. If, however, it is to the left of the distribution uh, of the critical value, we will not reject H0 because that means our R squared is sufficiently close to zero and therefore n times R squared is sufficiently close to zero that we cannot reject this case, the null hypothesis. So that is the basic idea of this auxiliary regression. And the important thing is, and this is what generalizes across many problems, that in the first step we estimate a restricted model. And then we use the estimated residuals from this restricted model, or later sometimes we'll use the squared of these when we're testing for heteroscedasticity, and then we'll use them as a dependent variable in an auxiliary regression, and we put stuff on the right hand side which will explain variation in the dependent variable if and only if the null hypothesis is not true. And in that case, we will get an r squared larger than zero, and therefore an n times r squared larger than zero. So I hope that helped a bit. This will this may become much clearer when we come to further examples of auxiliary regressions, especially in testing for heteroscedasticity and testing uh, for autocorrelation.